Steam locomotives in miniature at the Steam Workshop. This is part 7. Working on a 5 inch gauge steam locomotive, commencing the rebuild. This may seem like a fairly straightforward thing to do. I have a kit of parts, just put them back together. These are just a small collection of painted parts, expertly painted by Dave, who works at the Steam Workshop full time. And here is a kit of parts that I painted. This is the water pump using a paintbrush and a tin of Humbrol No. 19 Gloss Red. On the left of the image on screen is the pump ramp, and I replaced the O-ring because the old one was definitely past its best. But I'm looking for the cross pin. This was quite rusty, so I'm just going to clean this up. But I'm not going to do it in the lathe because everybody will complain. I'm going to do it in a different way. I do it by hand first, then I put it in an electric drill, so please don't complain about the grit from the emery cloth making a mess of the electric drill because it's just not going to happen. And as to sanding in the lathe or any other machine tool, I'd just like to mention something. What about a surface grinder? There must be a lot of grit in a surface grinder, so how do they work okay? Anyway, that's enough of this nonsense. It's time to put some lubricating oil on the pump ramp. To initially lubricate the pump ramp, I'm using some steam oil. Do not use motor oil. The additives will attack the silicone o-ring. Once the pump is in service and actually pumping water, the water itself passing through the pump takes care of the lubrication. In this clip, I'm just cleaning up the top fitting. This has some grooves in it so that when the ball is pushed against the top fitting, the water can still get past to go to the boiler. In my workshop, I would probably have put this in my acid bath, but in this case, I'm just using a craft knife blade to clear the slots. It's time now to fit the pump back together, and you can clearly see I haven't forgotten to fit the stainless steel ball back into the valve chest. So now, as usual, with steam and water fittings, I'm using some Loctite 542. This is a giant bottle of Loctite 542, quite unlike the small bottles I use in my workshop, but it does the same job. Here, I'm very carefully screwing the fitting into the pump body and tightening it up using my Barco spanner. That's as far as I can take the pump assembly for the time being. To be perfectly honest, I made a mistake with the chronological order of assembly here. Initially, I fitted the pump and the eccentric to the axle, and then tried to feed everything into place, but it didn't work that way. There'll be more about this in the next video. What I'm currently doing is oiling the wheel. No, I'm oiling the axle boxes, I just missed my target there. It's very important to make sure that all the oil ways are clear, and not blocked with paint or grime, and luckily these are okay. Someone else at Steam Workshop painted these wheels, but unfortunately, as you can see, not very well, and I'm scraping off some of the paint from the axle box. So the paint's missed the wheel, but it's got the axle box. Painting is an art that needs to be practiced, particularly hand painting. There's something worrying me about this engine. I haven't mentioned it up to now, but I'll go into detail in the next video. This is a suspension arrangement for the engine, a pair of springs on each axle box, and these haven't been cleaned up yet, so what I'm doing with them is throwing the whole lot in a pot of cellulose thinners. And cellulose thinners, as we all know, is called lacquer thinner in the USA. All of these suspension parts are just put in this bath of cellulose thinners, and then once they're all in there, whoops, I'll try not to knock it over, I'm going to stir it up vigorously with a paintbrush, and hopefully all the grime and old oil will just fall off and dissolve into the mixture. And already, as you can see, this powerful solvent is already changing colour. It's time to have a look at what John Holroyd's doing. And John Holroyd is making a tender. When I first saw this tender and the way John was making it, I thought, well, this is a little bit mad. Look at all the internal baffles inside the tank. Nobody's ever going to see that. But then John pointed out that it also serves a double purpose because it reinforces the tender because the driver sits on here. Just behind the tender, there's still work in progress on the Great Western Railway Grange class locomotive. You can clearly see the safety valve on the top feed assembly. This is an example of water jet cutting. It's metal cut using a high pressure jet of water. Cutting metal with water? How ridiculous. I've tried it in the shower, it doesn't work at all. At this point, I would like to issue a health and safety warning. I do not recommend taking a shower using a water jet cutting machine. John Holroyd's pretty good at multitasking. He always has several projects on the go at any given time. This is a nameplate he's been making on the CNC milling machine. And the finish on the milled parts is very smooth. It doesn't look it on the image, but it is very smooth. 
and here's the machine that's responsible for the very smooth milling. I watched this machine milling some locomotive wheels from solid steel a few weeks ago. For the viewer who asked me what kind of machine it is, well, this is what it is. I really would love a small CNC milling machine. They're a very useful tool, but unfortunately, they're very, very expensive, and I don't think I'm making enough money at the moment. Time to go back to reality, and I'm cleaning some metal parts in a bowl of cellulose thinners. I think it's time to get the parts out of the cellulose thinners now because they're probably clean. By the way, have a look at this. This is one of the spring hangers fitted with a pair of lock nuts. And look how badly damaged the lock nut is. This engine's been off the track a lot of times. There's evidence of this, so the engine must have a bit of a problem staying on the track. The rest of the work here is handwork, just cleaning up the parts on a piece of emery cloth. Very boring, very tedious, very necessary. These parts are so small and it's not really worth the time setting up the shop blasting cabinet to clean them. This is 100 grit emery cloth and it's doing a really good job of cleaning them anyway. These parts are not going to be painted, there's no point because they're always covered in oil and they don't go rusty. Having a look at the damage problem on the spring hanger bolts, sounds one or two alarm bells with me. More about this later as I just said. Quite a few years ago now I built an 040 model titch in 7.25 inch gauge. I have a 7.25 inch gauge railway all the way around the house. It's about 400 feet long, and in places it's a bit rough, bumps here and there. So it's important that the engine's suspension can cope with this, and I don't think the suspension on this engine has been set up properly, or maybe not even made properly. Time will tell, I'll show you in the next episode. Once again I'm using the electric drill and a piece of emery cloth to clean up these spring hanger pins. One of them was bent, so I put it in the vise and hit it with a hammer. Time for an interlude of ultraviolence. Although it was a soft hammer, and now when I test it on top of the vise, it's more or less straight. It's time now to fit these studs back into the axle boxes, and for this I'm using some True Lock 263, which is very similar to Loctite 601. Please note, because it's in a large bottle, I'm using far too much of it. But you get the idea. I put the nuts on the end of the studs and then tighten them into the hole. Then I let a bit of time elapse until the retainer adhesive has set. And I just undo the nuts and those of the studs fitted into the axle box fairly permanently. Once I clean off the excessive amount of adhesive using a cloth, the axle box looks like this. I'm going to speed up this next part because I have to repeat this process three times. When doing a job like this, it's best to fit the nuts to the studs before you put the adhesive in the holes. Because if you put the studs in the holes first, then you fit the nuts, you might find that the stud lock has grabbed. And then you would have a problem. The studs would only be partly in the hole, but very tight. So don't forget, nuts on first, then fit the studs. Before I can fit the axle boxes into the horn blocks, the horn blocks being the slots in the frame, I need to scrape off the paint. It's pointless masking off the inside of horn blocks because it's very simple to remove the paint using a small steel rule like this. You notice I call it a steel rule then. That's because I'm working in industry. I'm not in my home workshop. In my home workshop, it is a ruler. Because in my home workshop, I could call it whatever I liked. When one is working in industry, you have to use the correct terminology. But in this case, whether it's called a rule or a ruler, it's totally unimportant, it's really a scraper, and it's scraping off the paint very well. The inside of the horn blocks is now totally clean, I'm just brushing away the paint residue, and here I'm using the oil can with the extension spout to put some oil on the inside surfaces of the horn blocks. And now it's time to fit the axle boxes into the horn blocks, and they slide up and down very well with no side play at all. This engine is very well made and I think that's one of its problems. To check which is the best way around to fit this front wheel set, I removed it and rotated it and tried it the other way. And nothing tightened up, so everything is okay. That's the progress so far. The front axle is in the horn blocks. In the next episode, I'll be continuing with this reconstruction, fitting the other wheel set, and of course the pump between the frames. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.